Good afternoon, uh, good morning, and good evening to everyone who is joining us today. Thank you so much for uh, coming online. Today our webinar is focusing on operationalizing the Global Communication Polio Guide, and our objective is to understand um, and understand how to utilize the Global Communication Polio Guide and therein communications for development and polio outbreak response. Joining me today is Irma Monancor, uh, a senior consultant with UNICEF, and Sahar Higazi, communication for development specialist at UNICEF HQ. We're just waiting a few more minutes as uh, we begin uh, and have colleagues join us. To ensure good audio, please mute your computer and your microphones. So even if you, you think you might be muted, it's great to check one more time as that will um, help eliminate any echo or excess sound. Uh, and then we'll take any questions um, afterwards and ask you to use the instant messaging on the left hand side if you have any issues hearing. So we're going to begin now with the contents. Um, so Sahar will be presenting the introduction, which will cover the Polio Communication Global Guide and its four parts. And then the, the decision to vaccinate, so this process that we go through every time we have a campaign. And finally, the guiding principles for polio communications. Next will be Irma Monacor, who will um, walk you through the different outbreak scenarios you may face. And those include your initial outbreak scenario, an enduring scenario, and then the maintenance scenario. And after this, we'll have questions and answers. So now I'm going to pass it over to Sahar. Thank you very much, Alex, and welcome colleagues to this webinar. I hope you've had a chance to uh, connect to the link that gives you access to the Global Communication Guide, whereby you would be able to see four different booklets. One is the general book. The second one, which is the red one, on the outbreak that takes you more through some of the different concepts around outbreak communication. And the third one, which is the yellow book, is more for when the outbreak is longer and on during. And the last one, the green, is on the maintenance when you're done. So why did we put together, from the global perspective, why did we have the Global Communication Guide for Polio? We had this in order to be able to organize in a systematic way how we intervene around a polio outbreak and what specific communication steps would need to be taken in place, taken into account as well the SOP. We also had the manual as a way for planning effective strategies. As you would see later in the presentation, it would give you specific insights and steps on how to reach hard to reach population and in addition to further details on indicators and other useful tools. All of this you would be able to access in case you did not actually download it already on www.rhizome.org, which would take you not only through the Global Communication Guide, but also through a lot of other different resources that I'm sure you will find very useful. So let us start first by going through how is the decision for vaccination comes to happen. And that's only to remind ourselves of some of the basic things that probably all of you are aware of. But as a reminder, there are different steps that usually the caretakers from different experiences, from literature, from research, we found the caretakers usually take. And that path, it's important to remind ourselves, is not sequential. Some of the steps can happen in sequence. Some of the steps can happen together, and some of the steps can be completely skipped, whereby the decision maker or the caretaker reach the final decision automatically and directly. So the first one is more on the awareness and understanding on the disease. So initially, the caretakers has to understand what is the polio disease, be able to appreciate the, diff the, the the risk behind it so that he or she would be more sympathetic to vaccinate the child. The second step, which is also important, is awareness and understanding of the polio vaccine itself to have more confidence and trust to give to the child, as well as on the campaign dates. Without the campaign dates, as you would probably agree, 
The caretaker may not be able to know when to bring the child to the vaccination booth or when to be home to make sure the child is there. The third step is on the community perception of the polio vaccination. Usually we all face when the community is less receptive, less accepting of the polio vaccination. This is when we start to see symptoms of refusals, of drop, of absence, as well as other, other hidden reasons that are reported under the independent monitoring. And then the fourth step is the community perception of the health workers. The more the health worker is equipped with the right information to answer questions of the caretakers, to be able to manage refusals or vaccine hesitancy or any other questions, the more the chance that we will be able to reach every child. So with these steps, usually this is when we are able to get to a decision to have the child vaccinated. But let's remind ourselves that since we are already at the very last stage of the polio end game strategy, and when we are only facing less than 1% of the problem, and we're trying to overcome this last bit of the unreached children, let's remember some critical important principles while planning for our communication interventions. The first one, which is the importance of reaching every single child, and that would require being able to address and leverage the social norms, the perceptions, the beliefs behind the vaccination, and any of those bottlenecks that could stop the vaccination process. It's also important to remind ourselves that we're not anymore focusing on the one and individual caretaker. We're more focusing and looking after the entire social and community acceptance of the polio vaccination so that we can reach those un reach children or inaccessible children. This would require highly skilled health worker who is trusted by his community and who can also uh, be able to deal with any resistance and refusals. The last and important principle is how adaptive our communication approach is. As we will see later on on the scenarios, it's very important that not only we're data driven, be able to see quickly and real time how our interventions are or are not making the effect, but most importantly, how can we adjust quickly to the audience needs and to what we're hearing or even not directly hearing from the audiences in order to reach those every ch last children in, in the field. So which scenarios is your country in? Which outbreak are you currently facing? is what I would pass to Irma to continue for the rest of that webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sahar. And as we have the context um, for this discussion, remembering that we're talking about, one, the guiding principles and the decision-making um, process around vaccination. Now we're going to look at the particular phases within an outbreak, and we talk about three of them. We'll talk about the outbreak phase, which is at zero to six months, what is happening, what might we be focusing on. We'll talk about enduring outbreak, the second phase, which is six months plus, and maintenance, which is that particular phase when the outbreak has been officially closed. So let's take each one of these scenarios one by one. Let's look at the outbreak phase. When we're talking about outbreak phase, um, we're thinking about the communication work in two parts. There's a, a sub-phase, the first three months, what we will be doing and zeroing in on. And then there is the second phase, the four to six month period. Um, but what one should think about is in the outbreak, we really are talking about immediate communication. We're trying to focus in on the acceptors in a population, that 90% of the population, trying to get their awareness up around polio, what's happening with polio, and the fact that there's a campaign. That's our primary interest. In the second part of that time period, that four to six months, we're expanding it and we're much more interested in looking at rejectors in the population, the 10% that didn't respond positively to the earlier parts of our work, and we're looking at particularly the root causes of missed children. So we'll spend some time trying to even think about what could be potential barriers, which we are really trying to address in that phase two, of, if you will, of the immediate phase. And by that, we're looking at fatigue issues, 
we will be talking about mistrust of vaccines, even mistrust of the health care. So if we think about the outbreak communication phases, just to go a bit further, keep in mind in the immediate response communication phase, our focus is on maximizing awareness and maximizing awareness around the, the campaign itself and the fact that polio is in fact in the community. We're also trying to give more information to people around the campaign details, when it's going to occur, where it's going to occur. We're trying to introduce health workers who will be coming to see people in their homes, trying to find them in their communities to vaccinate the children. And generally the tone at this particular point in the communication process is one of urgency. We want people to feel they need to act now. Um, we, we talk about a tone that's simple, that's clear, and that's authoritative. That gives the sense that yes, we can do something about it, we can take action. And of course, in this particular part of the um, communication phase, we're really looking at mass media to get the word out, and we're looking at the use of public spaces. Remember, our focus is that 90% campaign awareness. So then, if we get the 90%, we start moving from that month four into what is called the adaptive phase. And there now, we're really trying to get to, as I said earlier, the potential people who have been rejecting or resisting or haven't responded to the earlier um, communication messages and discussions that have been going on in the community. And we're trying to use that work to get us to actually close out, trying to move in that direction. So what's our focus? Um, primarily we're trying to, at this particular point, is trying to adapt to the different causes why people have not responded. Whereas before it's getting information out, letting people know what's going on, now we're trying to understand better why aren't they responding? Why haven't we been able to reach them? And then what kinds of conversations we can have. So we're really focused at this point in the adaptive communication phase of trying to reach out to parents and caregivers who haven't responded positively earlier. At this point, yes, we will use mass media. Yes, we will use public spaces. But more importantly, we're very involved in working in with the health workers and in interpersonal communication, having the community meetings, having those discussions to try to work with caregivers and their communities to figure out solutions to the problems of why. In a more detailed focus in the um, standard operating procedures, uh, of course, that uh, is offered under the polio response, we even break down that first three months an even smaller time period. And what we're trying to show in this particular slide is that when we are talking about communication, we are really talking about the communications continuum. And the fact is that there's work going on within the first 14 days between both the external communications media people as well as the C4D community engagement people. And what you see in this particular slide is within the first 24 hours, Clearly, it is our colleagues and external communications and media that are taking the lead. They're trying to get the word out. It doesn't mean that C4D colleagues are not involved, but the leadership for that discussion is being led by another part of the communication uh, continuum. Within the first 72 hours, you see both the media colleagues and the C4D colleagues are working together. And as you look down further, you see C4D stepping up to take the lead all the way over into the 14 days. Because what we're talking about is a transition from just awareness raising to getting and getting the word out, to getting people involved themselves in solving problems, talking among themselves, getting the discussion larger within the communities. So you see the two are working together, but there is an emphasis shift of who might be taking the lead depending upon where we are in that 14-day cycle within the first three months. So if you think about it further, what I'm simply trying to do here is show you within that 24-hour, 72-hour, what kinds of parallel work may be going on as the two parts of communication are working with each other. So let's focus on the left-hand side. What you see is that the media and external communication colleagues 
One, they're trying to figure out and work with government colleagues and partners to say who's going to be the spokesperson, what will be the media landscape, what options, what channels do they have available that they can use to get the word out. There is the formulation of a media protocol and key messages in terms of getting the word out. You will see press briefings, media releases, things that we normally see in Q&As uh, Q around a polio outbreak. In a parallel manner, if you look on the right-hand side, you see that the communication for development colleagues are not idle. While others are focusing on the media side, you do have a group of people trying to get more information around the case investigation. And when I talk about social background, what do we know about the knowledge, the attitudes, the practices that are going on? That's what your C4D colleagues are trying to pull together. Trying to look at it, what are key messages at a community level that they can also be using to reinforce some of the more public statements that have gone on. Uh, looking at other media communication channels, uh, looking at influencers, looking at local leaders, who else can carry on the discussion and the dialogue with caregivers and their families. We will see during this time period the beginning of the development of a communication and social mobilization plan to kind of speak to the activities, the, the, the interventions, the, the focal points that, that will be addressed over the next six months, as well as identifying what might be capacity needs in terms of communication itself. So as you see, the two are working in tandem, but they're doing different things to complement the whole communications response to a polio outbreak. If we focus on communication for development uh, specifically, in the 14 days after, you may remember the previous slide that shows it is really at this point that C4D actually takes the lead and really runs forward with the polio outbreak. You see several things on this particular slide. One, the strong emphasis on community engagement. You see also the idea, again, of revitalized, reviewing, updating a social mobilization and communication plan the emphasis on interpersonal communication um, with a different level of workers who may be visiting communities, talking with people, not only social mobilizers, but don't forget, vaccinators are visiting communities, so they get experience and they get training around interpersonal communication. We will constantly be focusing in on rapid assessments. We want to constantly update ourselves on what's going on in terms of knowledge, attitudes and practices. There's a lot of work with micro planning and at this point is where you see C4D working very closely with their health counterparts, with the epidemiologists to do the micro planning so that the actual communication intervention, the community engagement intervention is really targeted and tailored to the particular caregivers that they're responding to. Work is around the information, education, and communication materials, especially those at community level. And of course, there's ongoing briefings with political, religious, and community leaders and stakeholders to keep them apprised of what's going on, what are the issues, what are the bottlenecks, and to try to find potential solutions to move forward. Enduring outbreak. This is that six months, the point in time at which we go beyond six months, we now consider ourselves to be in an enduring outbreak phase. And as you will note here, the particular focus is trying, to, as I mentioned earlier, is trying to get a handle on what are the barriers that may be stopping us from actually closing out the outbreak, and at the same time to try to refine, modify, adapt, accelerate our strategies to get to our goal point. So the emphasis will be on doing a root cause analysis, trying to understand not just the knowledge, attitude, and practices, but what are the bottlenecks? What are the obstacles? What are the barriers for things not moving in the direction that we anticipate and developing strategies to try to do that? Our primary audience at this point are the rejectors, that 10% that haven't responded. But keep in mind, we have those acceptors, so we do want to pay attention to them as well 
during this period because we don't want them to drop out because of fatigue. They've been with us for the first six months and we want to keep them going for the rest of the time until the outbreak is over. So we're doing a dual focus, if you will, at this particular point in time. Yes, you will find in during outbreak phase, we still will work with mass media, but at the same time, an even stronger emphasis is placed on the interpersonal communication, especially with the frontline workers who will be in the communities talking with caregivers, talking with parents, talking with community leaders. Uh, uh, what are the issues? How do they see the issues? What are solutions that they can also collectively help bring to trying to bring the outbreak to an end? We also are working with celebrities. Um, so keep them in mind that they're still a part of this as well. But when you're thinking about people who aren't vaccinated, Okay, so when we're thinking about uh, why people may not be vaccinating their children, I think there's two ways to think about this particular issue in, our, in the experience. One, you have inaccessible children. For whatever reason, they're in a location, they're in a part of the country that can't be reached. And so they become inaccessible because one, there's a perception of fear. People think there's something wrong with the vaccine. Uh, if they vaccinate the child, there will be some negative repercussion to them or their family members. There may be some reaction from anti-government elements that make it difficult to reach these children. There may be security concerns, so the workers themselves can't get there to the children. And there just may be some management issues within the program itself. Then you have children who are accessible. They can be reached. And sometimes we find they're not getting vaccinated because one, the team is not there. They're just not anyone in that particular area to respond. Or when the team does show up, they're in a location where they can be reached, but the parent says the child's not available. Either he or she is sick, they happen not to not be at home because they're traveling, some other reason is given. And finally, there is the direct refusal. You can get to the household, you can get to the um, family, but the parents say, no, not my child, not today. So there are reasons why, again, in the enduring outbreak, we're trying to understand better why it's not happening, and then to figure out strategies to respond to it directly. So what are some other key issues? that um, one can experience that lead to some of the things I just described earlier. One, repeated campaigns. Um, we have experience that say that it tells us that parents and caregivers keep asking questions, but I did it last year and I may have done this the year before. You've just come five times. Why are you coming again? So trying to respond and answer questions around repeated campaigns. Um, there is some areas there's still the belief that oral polio vaccine is unsafe. It's going to uh, cause a problem in the family. It's a way to sterilize the children, those kind of beliefs. You may have beliefs that the vaccine is ineffective. Even if you vaccinate, somebody's going to get an out uh, of polio. Uh, there's campaign mistrust, mistrust, either people not liking the workers, there's something they don't understand, there's people, there's some reason for whatever experience they may have had in the past that may be influencing their decision or their perception of why they don't want their children vaccinated. I have mentioned already the fact that children may be unavailable. That is, the parent says they're absent, they're sleeping, they're sick. They give a reason. They would if you normally let them in, but today they won't because the child's sick, sleeping, or absent. In some instances, we've even had the experience where people believe that polio is curable, so there's no need to do anything. There's no reason to vaccinate the child. They'll just come out of it on their own. And finally, we've experienced um, in, in the cases of an outbreak where it might be a vaccine-driven polio virus. And now one has got to explain to the, the public and to the family members, but we vaccinated our child and still somebody got it. So why are you doing the vaccination now? So these are some of the kind of issues, some of the problems that are raised that, again, we have to think about the strategies, the communication approaches we're going to use to try to respond to those kind of issues that we raised. At the moment in which an outbreak is officially declared over, 
we are now in the maintenance phase. And that is really transitioning from a, a targeted, tailored focus on polio to a more general discussion around health to get more from the emergency response on a polio outbreak to more of the development response and resilience of communities to respond. And so at this particular point in time, what are we concerned about? We're still concerned about acceptors because we continued to want them to get their children involved in vaccinations around polio, but we want them to expose themselves to other kinds of vaccines. So what you may find in the maintenance phase is whereas people accept the polio vaccine, they're resisting some other kind of vaccine. So we're not saying automatically because they have accepted polio, they're going to agree to everything else. So the work is not done. What one does in maintenance phase, though, is take the experience, the lessons learned, the good practices from the earlier phases to help now to get into the maintenance phase and really get that movement from polio to the larger discussion of child health. What are all those other kinds of things that can happen to a child and get the parents involved in that particular process? So we'll spend some time looking at issues of the rejectors to see what, what's going on around other kinds of areas and how we might use our polio experience to help us respond to that. We'll look at even further how do we strengthen the humanization of the frontline worker, the health worker. This person is not just for polio. This person is there to help you and your community for your children and your children's health in general. And we'll still be working with community influencers and we'll still be working with celebrities. So we're taking the experience from the outbreak. We're taking experience from the enduring outbreak and we're using that to help us guide forward our work on maintenance, or as we can also say, the development work. So we're transitioning back to the larger health agenda, the larger development agenda. With those are the three phases. Now we're at that point where it's your turn to ask questions that you may or make observations that you want to share with us. So we'll stop here. Thank you, Irma, very much. So we'll give you a few moments to gather your thoughts. And if you have any questions, you can write them in the messaging in the bottom left corner, and we'll answer them. Um, so thinking about uh, any part of the presentation, if you want to direct your question to Sahar or to Irma or to both, we're happy to receive them. OK, so the first question we have here is from Narcisse. It says, is it relevant to think that in large countries like Nigeria, there may be coexistence of two scenarios? And I'll pass that over to Irma. Yes, I think you could think of it in that particular way, because it would have a differentiated strategy that you were applying. If you were in a part of the country, say Nigeria, say in, in Lagos, you might have an outbreak situation going on that you're responding to directly. In another part of the country, they may have had an outbreak earlier, and they're at a different point in time in that particular process. So if you think about it in that way, yes, you would talk about a differentiated strategy, rather than just saying everybody's either in enduring or everybody's in outbreak. Thank you very much, Irma. Uh, we have a few more questions coming in now. So, Har, do you want to add anything? Um, thank you, Alex, and thanks, Irma. I just would add one sentence. Now that we're seeing less and less of the wild polio virus with only three countries, and even less outbreaks, for example, in 2016 compared with 2015, to take it further, even in endemic countries, I think you would probably, some of you who are working there have even more the knowledge that it's only a few provinces or a few regions where you still have the virus circulating and this is where you need to be intensively working but then you might want to think about the rest of the country either in the maintenance phase or like in the stay alarmed or keep tuned to make sure that your communication materials are always ready your tactics are in place your partners are very much fully aligned and or continuing to do what they are doing already to keep the 90 or 95% that Irma was referring to 
always uh, uh, ready and willing to vaccinate their children every single time and not to drop from you any time. Thank you, Sahar, for this addition. I have another question uh, from Sharmili. She asks, moving to the larger health agenda in maintenance phase, is there guidance on how to work with leadership to transition tasks to integration activities? If you can speak a little bit more on this. Well, first of all, uh, you may remember that Sahar mentioned that you have um, uh, the communi global communication guide. And if you look in, my, in the manual number four, you will see some concrete ideas around um, that, whole that whole transition period, the whole maintenance period. But I think you cannot avoid, when we're at this particular point, that ongoing discussion with your immunization and your child health colleagues. There's no formula for that yet. And it really is a country by country discussion, given what the issues are, uh, what the challenges are, what the way forward would be. What you would bring to that discussion, however, would be your experience in working with local communities in terms of the community engagement, your experience with working with the larger media, and now you're looking at how can you integrate that with the work that may be going on with immunization and with child health. So you're looking for those windows of opportunity that may exist in a particular country. But please look very carefully at Manual 4. It gives some very interesting ideas on things that you can do specifically. Thank you very much, Sharmili, for this question. OK, so we have a question from, um, from Herman. It asks, can we discuss a bit more about a case where two or more outbreaks occur, let's say, in different parts of the same country, and the use of available resources? Well, I think that's where you're going to really have to have that discussion around your micro planning. And that's a discussion that's held not only as a communication for development uh, specialist, but it's the work with the epidemiologists, it's work with the larger health group to sort out, one, the sharing of those resources. So you look at what are those things that you can use um, at a mass media level that might work. But the key would be if you have different levels of an outbreak going on, is what are you doing at the community level? And that definitely gets you in the micro planning, the strategizing around what can happen in this district versus another district in terms of really allocating those resources. So I can't give you a rule of thumb, but the, the idea would be that's what your micro planning is the key thing that will help you move forward in this area. Um, I would add that also it would be extremely important for the C4D manager to make sure that he or she is always switching between the national macro level vision and the micro community specific vision because you don't want to keep you do not want to lose sight of the entire overall country landscape how the rest of the public or the rest of the country are, are reacting. Uh, are you creating over uh, worry or over anxiety by the other regions where you don't have an outbreak versus in the meantime, maintaining a very close contact with the communities, being able to explain why them, if you're only having limited campaigns in these areas, for example, compared with national campaigns for the rest of the countries. So being able to always switch between the national activities and the interventions at that level between media and C4D versus the ones at the community level where you're having the problem. Over. Thank you, Irma and Sahar. We have a few more questions coming in now. All right, let me just respond additionally to that, saying to the uh, question that Irma made is on the importance of getting that root cause analysis done. And that is building on what Sahar has just said at the at the at the more local subnational level to really try to understand what's happening. And when you think about resources, then at this particular point, you probably are talking about how are you going to link in your frontline um, workers if you have those. How might you involve community influencers? But again, that assumes that you have a good grasp of what is understood happening at the local level. Thank you, Irma. We have a question here from Saeed asking, or suggesting rather, if narrow casting, so narrow casting from broadcasting may help in the outbreak. 
Yes, it's not an either or. I think the way to think about this is, yes, you'll do the mass media, and you may see that in the very beginning. But again, what you're intervening around is driven what you understand to be the issues, and that's your knowledge, your attitude and practice assessment, your root cause analysis. So yes, definitely I would agree if that's the point of the question, you want to do both. You want to have that broad view as Sahar was talking about, but you also want to be able to narrow it down and zero right in on what are the issues in a particular community, in a particular district that need to be focused on. And that's working with community leaders, that's working with social mobilizers. So the two are working in tandem to reinforce each other. Thank you, Irma. Do you have anything to add? Um, I would just add to what Irma said. Irma highlighted both in her presentation and repeatedly in her feedback the idea that we're working together with our immunization colleagues as well as, uh, in that case, if UNICEF is leading on the C4D with our WHO colleagues who will be leading on the epidemiological and operational response. So if, for example, the decision from the EPI side is to go on a subnational level, or to do phasing, small, and then go large to national, and or do a combination of both. This will pretty much decide on how you're going to be taming in your communication response, because you cannot go in isolation of that. Only you can do more preparation at different levels so that you're ready when the moment comes where you either need to go super and high national, for example, versus only advocacy, or working only at the level of the community. We have another question here from Shafiq. He, he asks, in a place where peace and security are the priority of country leadership, um, it can often be difficult to convince the leadership that immunization is also a priority. And I think he's asking, how can you uh, emphasize having multiple priorities such as those? But I think the issue is, how do you link the immunization to peace and security? It's not a matter of saying, talk about, for, at least in my experience, it hasn't been about talking about immunization alone. But what I try to do is link it to what are some of those other issues to help people see that by addressing human uh, immunization, one can begin talking about issues because you've got the confidence of uh, communities, you've gotten them to get involved, you can enter into other kinds of discussions around issues that may have security implications to them or peace implications. I think it's trying to, I think it's remembering that people are holistic generally in their thinking. So things are linked to them. So the more we can link our work in say health and immunization to some of these other issues, the more likely people are willing to listen and have a discussion with us. Again, that's sitting down saying, if I understand that peace and security is an issue, how can immunization, how can getting children vaccinated help make that happen. That's the kind of discussion. I would also add to what Irma said, that in a situation when we have uh, a, a, an acute security issues, and normally in, in most of the situation, this is also attached with some kind of a humanitarian response operation, if it's a real humanitarian crisis. And that's also a chance for us, whether from UNICEF or WHO or together, we position the immunization response as part of that humanitarian response. And that's by default is part of the entire human rights and child rights agenda. So in most of the situations, if not all, and I would echo what Irma said by experience and from experience, even senior general army, most highly ranked officials are extremely supportive, sympathetic, and it's not a matter of debating yes or no, it's just a matter of trying to see what would be the best moment of time to be uh, protective of the immunization teams and to help us come in and do what we have to do or let the people who are somehow trapped in uh, a war zone area be able to come out for the children to have the immunization. Over. Thank you both Irma and Sahar for those comprehensive answers. We have a question from Glenn here. Do anthropologists have a role? Uh, I think in polio outbreak response, and are there services available or I think required would be the other question. Definitely. I think when you've heard me say several times, 
um, the importance of understanding um, what's going on, getting to the root causes. And I think what we've seen in the uh, in the pol in response to polio outbreaks, the use of anthropologists and, and, and qualitative research to get a better understanding of that. I think the trick has been able, has been, once one engages anthropologists, how to do it in a way that's quick, that allows it to be a rapid assessment that people can use from a programmatic sense. But definitely there's a role. And I think um, that UNICEF has been very proactive in identifying uh, anthropologists and organizations that do qualitative research to make themselves available and their services available to help teams do some of this work. Thank you very much, Irma. So we have a comment here, as Sahid has uh, pointed out, a, a close collaboration between security establishment and polio teams at policy and tactical levels is a great help, and that, that's definitely something we see time and time again when we're trying to reach inaccessible areas, and that's why it's really important to have the support and, and work in, in tandem with the government. We have a, another comment, I think, from Herman. He says, we now face more polio fatigue within the communities, uh, and the question about how convincing to be while communicating when unfortunately an outbreak occurs to engage the community again, even though numerous campaigns have been conducted in a short time period. That's really one of the challenges, and that's why you will see that increasing emphasis on interpersonal communication, because at that particular point after the campaigns is having that discussion, getting people to accept that the social mobilizers or the frontline workers who come to them are people from their community who are concerned about the community, having those kind of discussions with them. Because it is one of the things that we have to accept that over time there is polio fatigue. So we're still having to explain why it's happening, trying to understand what those issues are with communities. But that happens on a one-on-one -on -one personal basis that's different than the mass media. Mass media won't help us at that point. Thank you very much, Irma. Do we have any questions or comments from colleagues, UNICEF colleagues that are online and joining us from either country office or regional offices, uh, or if anyone in general who has questions? But it would be great to hear from some colleagues as well. We have another question here from Shafiq. Uh, if we realize that there is a lack of accountability and transparencies at different levels, how do we deal with this tactfully? I think the way to deal with it is collectively. And collectively meaning the entire GPI partners, so it's not one voice of one agency, it's all partners coming together. Also by ensuring that there is a mechanism at a national, subnational level that would review the progress and have, uh, and there is a process for doing this that's transparent for everyone, and that also feeds to other levels, higher and, and lower, to complete the accountability circle. But then third and most important, I, I always believe in the voice of community, and let's not underestimate the power of the voice of community when they are convinced, when they believe that this service is important for the, for the best interests of their children, should something wrong happen, and if they have this information right up front, they will be the ones really pushing harder to make sure whoever in the circle who's not really doing his or, or her part uh, be in a situation to do what they have to do. So I, I hope that addresses the point that you probably had, and maybe Irma would have something to add. I would simply say by the question, I'm not sure if you're referring to something internal in terms of uh, organization uh, being um, maybe not being accountable or, lack, uh, or being uh, non-transparent. But I think when it's internal, then clearly that means trying to talk with other people within your organization with whom you have confidence that you can share information so that you can strategize on how to present it. Um, if it's external, I agree with um, Sahar, I think uh, sometimes communities know things already. What they don't have is the space to say them. And your role may be simply one of giving them that opportunity to express it up front. But I think there is a difference when you're dealing with something in, like this issue on accountability internally, because it's an internal problem versus it's an external problem. Thank you very much, Irma. 
I think this is all the questions we have. If you do have more questions that come to mind later on, please feel free to email me. Um, my name is Alex, as you may have recognized by now. We really appreciate all your participation. And I'll ask uh, Irma if she'd like to say a final word and then Sahar before we sign off. Just a reminder that you do have the global guide. Uh, I think the link has been provided. Please look very um, carefully when you have time at those four different manuals. They give incredible ideas. They give rules of thumb. They give you suggestions on things you might consider. And of course, they're just a guide. Think of it as a, a, a platform, but it's always open to modification and adaptation, and we think your experiences will enrich them. Thank you, Erman. Alex, I think the one thing I would end with is that this guide gives you an opportunity to put all your creative thinking, your experience, and apply them in a systematic way. And be it polio, immunization program, any other disease or emergency outbreaks, you can still apply the same science and the same concepts, as long as that is following a clear systematic and rigorous way of doing it. I think that's the most important thing that the communication and C4D science is, is calling upon uh, all of us now. Thank you. So with that, I thank everyone for participating all around the world at all different times of day, to Irma and Sahar for presenting today. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to write me. I would like to invite you now uh, for the next webinar, which will be November 11th on a Friday, at the same time as we always have done here. And that will be overlooking uh, monitoring and evaluation in polio outbreak response, in specific with communication for development in mind. And Irma will be joining us again for that and presenting. So we will send you out the formal invitation by email, but just so you can mark that on your calendars now. Thank you again for joining us, and have a great evening or day. <laughs>